dictionary definition of music is the art of arranging sounds in time through the elements of melody, harmony, rhythm, and timbre. Low Pass Filter is a show about the nature of this thing we call music, how it functions in people's lives, how it's contextualized by society, and why we find certain music meaningful. This is Low Pass Filter. Hello, and welcome to Low Pass Filter. This is a show about music and what it means in our lives. My name is Mateo Noche, and I'm here with our co-host, Bandon Wayne. Bandon... How you doing, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me again, Matt. Yeah, Always beware the be Ides of March. <laughs> what was that? I said, beware the Ides of March. Ah, yeah. It's the uh, the fifteenth, and I it's crazy that uh, that we're this far into the year already. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's been some couple decades, probably that I've realize the first part of the year seems to go by really fast and then the second half seems to go a little slower for some reason well the the time has been weird anyway uh, you know given covid and and all the other stuff that's going on in the world so uh yeah indeed today uh we're going to talk about music with a function and that's my 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 topic. My turn to, to pick the topic. And uh, so uh, ordinarily, we think of music as you know something we listen to and uh, enjoy. And uh, but there are music that do jobs in society, um, and or whatever uh, different kinds of things. Um, you know, probably the first music, of course, uh, that had a purpose, that we had a function, was religious music, right? So, you know, Gregorian chant, you know, or, you know, hymns uh, later on uh, as we got into uh, the, the more modern era. Uh, there are music that, that gives you group identity, you know. Uh, there are like songs that, that people sing at soccer matches, you know. For, for their team and their side and uh, or, or sort of musical chants that they do, you know, especially uh, in England and on the and in Europe uh, as well. Um, sell a product or uh, film music is another function, a, music, a functional music. Um, increasing nationalism or propaganda, you know, along the same line. Uh, or dance, just something as simple as uh, music to dance to. So, um, as always, we have our Spotify playlists. You can find them in the description below. Uh, we each have one for the music that we picked out. We do that because uh, we not because we're cheap, but because we don't want to have to pay uh, or have our uh, this video monetized. Uh, which is something that uh, uh, YouTube would do if we put in anything that was recognizable uh, by the way of music. So you can find our Spotify playlist. You can uh, uh, follow along as we talk about these songs. Uh, and uh, I don't know. Should, why, don't, why don't you start off? What do you, what do you have uh, on your list? Um, give us a couple of yours. All right. Sure. Um so you listed off some of the the uh, big examples of music that is with a functionality behind it uh, for a purpose. I suppose we could say beyond just pleasure or listening, uh, simply to enjoy the the art artistry and creativity of the of the musical artist. Um, so I, I was going to say I think my playlist is maybe just a little out of order. Um, but uh, I think w- where I started was um, relaxation or meditational music. Um, 
you mentioned uh, religious music. Um, you know, Gregorian chants is uh, is an example of old uh, um, Catholic um, sort of worship music or devotional music, I suppose. Um, but uh, I think the the meditative and relaxation. Uh, music came to my mind first because I happen to really enjoy music like that. Um, actually, more for the artistry than actually the functionality of it, although it is very relaxing for me. Um, I find that uh, that there actually is a lot of creativity and, and interesting musicianship to be found in in that realm of music. Um, you know, so. In the 70s, you had a lot of stuff that was um, meditational, but a lot of it focused kind of uh, in the area of exploring space, um, kind of cosmic music. Um, so I think that kind of led to the term New Age in the 80s. And... Um, Unfortunately, New Age kind of developed a negative connotation for a lot of people who liked, you know, popular music and rock and roll music and stuff like that. You'd think of Ray Lynch with Deep Breakfast or Enya. Um, and I didn't put examples of those. I put some other uh, stuff. But, um, you know, I, I guess people took it to be kind of soft and without, you know, w without a... a an attitude, but really it has its, its own attitude. And, um, you know, I, I guess the intention behind it is to, to chill out and relax and maybe tap into, um, some other vibrations that can be healing. Um, so I guess that would be a good way to describe it too: music for healing. Um, and certainly if you go to a cool, uh, herbal store or, um, naturopathic type store usually you can find some music there that that kind of goes hand in hand with the practice of of such things so i started with that and then uh i i picked out a two or three songs uh aimed towards children um uh, uh raffi is a big example there um but that came to my mind because a lot of music like that is designed to uh help children progress to, to grow and to learn. Um, so I thought that fit the category. Well, um, it can certainly be music that sounds like other popular music, but it's, it's, uh, geared towards the young mind. Um, I tend to like the stuff like that, that is for the young mind, but is, is relevant to anyone. Um, I always thought Sesame Street music was a great example of that because it didn't speak down. It didn't pander to being young and naive. It was like, hey, a kid can understand a, a, a groovy tune, but we'll blend that with with uh, educational ideas. And and uh, so I always dug on stuff like that. A couple of uh, these people that uh, were really great writers, you know. And we're jazz guys, and uh, you know, um, so they had some real talent. Um, yeah. That. And I also think of like the Electric Company was another one. Uh, yeah, yeah. That had that thing. Now you you mentioned new age music, and and uh, so I kind of went back a generation uh, to Exotica, Diana, <laughs> you know. So I had Martin Denny in there, who I, I'm a huge uh, Martin Denny fan. Um, and I also put in Herb Albert, um, not Hawaiiana, but he's uh, very, uh, what you call easy listening, I guess, would be, would be his category. And so sometimes this is referred to as musical wallpaper. You know, music you can have on in the background. It doesn't, you know, it's not interruptive or interfering your tasks or whatever you're trying to do. Um, I find that, uh, you know, I can't listen to modern music when I'm trying to read, you know, uh, I, the baseline just takes me away from anything that happens. So, uh, things like classical music, uh, easy listening music, um, 
even new and new age to a certain extent, uh, which I like to call gift shop music. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of is something that you can listen to without, uh, you know, without it interrupting your train of thought. So uh, yeah, and I kind of I I put in uh, Casino Royale and a uh, by uh, Herb Albert and a couple of things by Martin Denny, and I really didn't even know anything about them until uh, this uh, uh, movie called Atomic Cafe, which came out in the 80s, which was about the nuclear tests uh, in the South Pacific. And uh, the entire movie was basically set to that type of music because it kind of what was going on in the background at the time. And so I went out and found my, my first Martin Denny record in the cutout bin you know, at the local record store, uh, or maybe even the, in the used bin, you know, and, uh, I just really appreciated the artistry. I mean, they, you always think of Muzak, uh, is another one that comes up a lot. Uh, and you think of that as just, you know, throwaway, uh, kind of music without any, um, virtuosity or any, you know, any real chops behind it. But especially in the case of like Martin Denny and Arthur Lyman and um, some of these other uh, groups, I mean, they were really great players, you know, and uh, doing innovative things, including bird calls, <laughs> uh, you know, in the middle of their songs. So, uh, yeah, so that kind of that kind of cues off of that new agey uh, and, you know, musical wallpaper. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that music in particular can be very engaging. Um, there actually is some edge to it, but it has that quality that can be in the background, um, that quality that is inoffensive to most people. I'm, I'm sure that some people may have a really strong aversion to hearing it, uh, but for the most part, uh, that's why they called it, like you said, Muzak or elevator music, because it it creates an ambiance without feeling um, uh, aggressive to most people. Most people just accept that it's there, and maybe even can can uh, give people a, a sense of calm. Muzak exactly designed for that. People have a tendency to think that it was meant to lull you into. Uh, you know, complacency or, or what have you, or keep you calm. But it was originally intended to make people work harder. Uh, so they would, uh, the first music came in 15 minute blocks or Muzak came in 15 minute blocks and it would get progressively faster and faster and faster in tempo to, to make the listeners uh, work harder. And then it would be alternated with 15 minutes of silence. So it would go through these, the original Muzak, the concept was 15 minutes of music, 15 minutes of silence. But the Muzak was always getting faster and faster to try and motivate people to work harder or, or uh, you know, build more widgets, or, you know, shop faster or, or whatever they might have been do doing. Is there, a, is there a specific place of origin where that came from? Uh, this, uh, it was, Muzak was invented by this guy named Theodore Adorno. Uh, who uh, started the company in the 1930s. Uh, you, you kind of think of it as a 50s or 60s phenomenon, but he, he um, started back in 1937. And uh, he, uh, you know, thought he even, I mean, he thought of jazz as, as qualified as music. He thought that jazz was uh, essentially wallpaper. Uh but yeah, so he, he really got big in the 50s and, and, and the post-war world when shopping malls became a thing and uh, you know, and elevator music, as you mentioned before, uh, supermarkets, uh, although in my supermarket, uh, I, uh, they, they play synth pop now. So, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know if that qualifies as music now. But uh, one of the original investors in uh, Muzak was Lyndon Baines Johnson, the uh, president of the United States, <laughs> who was a huge investor and promoter of, of Muzak. Um, but yeah, its heyday was the 50s, 60s, and then kind of into the 70s. 
uh, and then it just sort of started failing, fading away and being replaced by everyday music. Now you can listen to, uh, you know, uh, Human League in, in, while you're shopping for tomatoes, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's that's perfectly acceptable. Yeah, today it would probably be similar to what you might hear on the on the pop oldies station, which is now music from the 60s through the 80s. Yeah, somebody said something funny uh, the other day that um, it was in a chat, but they they said they had this moment at the at the grocery store where they heard like seven great songs in a row. <laughs> I was like, yeah, usually I'll get maybe two or three, but seven, man, that would <laughs> that'd be exciting. On my list, I had things, uh, you know, like "We Are the Champions." by uh queen yep and uh we will rock you you know which uh have sort of been taken over by sports franchises you know you'll hear it played in at football games or soccer matches or what have you so it's music that didn't start out with a functionality but acquired a functionality along the way yeah uh, yeah um who was um uh British glam rocker. Um, I didn't think of that one for my list, but um, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Gary Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter. That's right. Yeah, he he had a song. That, one, I think, is the name of that song. There you go. Yeah, that became a sports anthem. Yeah. You can go back to the '60s with um, Hey Hey, uh, Nah Nah Hey Hey. Kiss them goodbye. Yeah, and even things like Sweet Caroline. I think I think it's the uh, Boston, uh, the uh, the White Sox or the Red Sox uh, use that as, as their theme. And it, and if you go to see the Crabs here in Humboldt County, you, you'll hear hear that a lot uh, being played. Uh, another example of a music that has a function is ice cream truck music. <laughs> Man, that did not come to me. That's, yep, yeah. So, you know, it, and the purpose is, is uh, you know, purely commercial uh, to alert the kids that the ice cream truck is in the neighborhood uh, and get them out there to, uh, to uh, buy some ice cream. I mean, I remember uh, as a kid hearing the ice cream uh, truck from, I must have been a mile away, you know, <laughs> And then uh, getting some money off my mom and getting on my bike and going out to search out the ice cream man was yeah. very, very exciting. Uh, That's such um, a cool thing. That's something that uh, I really appreciate still exists today. It's not quite the same paradigm, but, uh, you know, somebody gets the idea to, to start a roving ice cream truck. I think that's a great thing. Um, so I would guess that the origin of of that music is maybe in the sort of uh circus calliope kind of music or something like that unique sound it's a very i mean it's music for a commercial purpose so i noticed uh some intersection with our uh a list is the is the jingle i'd like to buy the world a coke uh, which is uh, a way of selling uh, soft drinks to people. Yeah, for sure. I saw that on your list, and uh, I included a couple other commercial jingles, I think. Um, but that one is, that's a big one. Um, and I think when that song came along, it was before my time, I believe. Um, but it, it, you know, it ran as their ad for quite some time, and it seems to me they were trying to tap into the the youth culture, the kind of hippie era, coming together uh, communally. Um, so it has that feeling of kind of like a a kumbaya campfire, kind of unifying spiritual almost for the for the the hippie era. At least that's my impression of it. Thank you. 
Welcome back to Low Pass Filter. We're talking about music with a function today. Um, and uh, I have kind of an odd music with a function, uh, uh, which is uh, Made in Japan by Deep Purple, <laughs> which in, in is nobody's uh, idea of music with a function, but I use it exclusively to clean the house. <laughs> So I, I put on uh, I put on Made in Japan, which, by the way, if you're not familiar with this record, uh, you should get it and just uh, uh, play it. Um, there's a new uh, uh, expanded version out with some extra uh, material on it, which is uh, also really great. But I just find it to be uh, it's very energetic, uh, and it uh, for for me purposely, my function for uh, Deep Purple Made in Japan is uh, uh, to get as much done in the in of a task that I'm not that happy about in the shortest period of time. <laughs> That's great, man. Uh, so deep purple equals deep cleaning. Yes. For you. <laughs> uh, I use that record to just rock the heck out. Um, but that's that's an interesting one that you bring up because uh, when I was 13 or 14, I discovered that album, I think around 13, maybe I used to have it on an auto repeat cassette deck and I would fall asleep to it night after night. So I didn't think I was necessarily using it to fall asleep, but, um, it just happened to kind of coincide with that time of night and drifting off. And then I would wake up and hear it still playing. If it's a sidebar, but if you've never heard um uh the or oh, i'm gonna draw a blank now help me out the the heavy ballad tune on there child, child in time yeah child in time if you've never heard that live version <laughs> go get yeah. it some of me part of me thinks that deep purple might have been uh the, the uh uh inspiration for spinal tap in some in some ways <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, that, they're the same, I mean, that particular version of Deep Purple, there are a lot of different versions of Deep Purple, but the Ian Gillen, uh, Glover, uh, Richie Blackmore, uh, you know, version of that band uh, it very much feels like the Spinal Tap era. I mean, it's, it's, there's some bombast there. We're going on a complete tangent here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they, they were fairly bombastic. Uh Super duper talented. Uh, Ian Gillen uh, was just, uh, he was amazing. Of course, went on to uh, do uh, the, I think he originated the role of in Jesus Christ Superstar, which you see on your list. So, uh, yeah, great for cleaning the house. Next time you clean it, <laughs> put on Made in Japan, and you'll see how much you get done in a very short period of time. Man. I'm going to try that. <laughs> um, I want it to be uh, fairly linear, but I guess it's not that important. When we were talking about uh, meditational music and relaxation music, I had one other thing on there as an example that's kind of a newer concept, or at least it's become more popular lately, called ASMR. And unfortunately, I always forget what ASMR stands for. I should have written that down. <laughs> um, but a lot of the stuff you'll hear there, hardly anybody would consider it music. Um, I personally uh, accept sound in various uh, ways of expression um, to be music if you want to consider it music. Uh, so, you know, like say the avant-gardists like John Cage and, and people like that from the earlier part of the 20th century to mid century, um, you know, who considered that music, uh, you know, not the majority for sure. Um, but to me it can be, and I tend to, to like to use the term soundscape a lot. Um, because for me, it's, it's, it is a form of music, I guess, because it's sound being pleasing and lighting up. I think that's the same part of my brain, um, even though it may 
may or may not have melody and rhythmic structure and things like that. It might even be sometimes uh, dissonant sounds or abrasive sounds or field recordings of just things occurring. But anyway, I, I thought that tied in. Um, the example I put in my Spotify playlist, I think is a really long thing that, that is very typical ASMR sounds, which a lot of people use to either quell anxiety or fall asleep to people with insomnia. I actually discovered it through my son. He would fall asleep playing ASMR videos on YouTube. <laughs> I found it very curious at first, but it, it's interesting stuff. Now, I noticed you have the Environments records it's on there. A couple, a couple examples off the Environments series of records. That's um, right. That could be considered that same sort of thing. Uh, yeah. rain, uh, rain and thunderstorms. Uh, and I forget what the second one was. Yes. Uh, shoot. Um, it could be like a, a stream or ocean sound. I, for some reason, I'm not seeing it. Oh, there we go. Gentle rain in a pine forest. <laughs> um, I love those records. Um, I don't often sit and you know put them on, um, but I do quite enjoy that that sort of uh, textural um, experience with sound. Um, but I also enjoy playing around with it, sampling it, um, mixing two records together, and having having those natural sounds in there can be uh, a nice experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, the other things that I have on here are uh, things that maybe go along in the political realm, you know? Uh, so I, I had Hail to the Chief, uh, which is a song that's played when the president uh, is at a ceremony of some sort or another and comes walking out. Uh, taps. Is another one um, which uh, is played at military funerals. Mm -hmm. uh, it was never meant for that. Originally, it was meant basically as lights out for uh, army uh, people during uh, the Civil War, uh, but it eventually became uh, uh, um, connected with funeral uh, music for military people. And then I noticed on your list you have the Chopin uh, Funeral March as well, which is another piece of music that I I think you really, it's like an arch-typical arch uh, song uh, connected with death, you know. I'm not sure that anybody plays it at their funerals anymore. Uh, you're probably more likely to get Sweet Caroline or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, than that, but it, it really does uh, immediately associate with uh, death and funerals. Yeah. Well, it's in the title of the song. Um, yeah. Um, that is very much uh, for that specific functional purpose. Um, I, I, I'm sure if you enjoy classical music, you know, you'd appreciate that uh, on its own merit as a composition and piece of music. Um, but, uh, yeah. And also, um, marching music in, in general. Um, and I think we touched on this before perhaps, but, um, a core element in the roots of, of modern 20th century music when we, when we started, uh, you know, having the development of jazz music um, and then eventually rock and roll music, the, uh, the drum corps, the marching band music, you know, at one time, those musicians would be out on the field with the soldiers. Um, and then, of course, playing for, for military events as well, homecomings of, of soldiers after their tours things like that, but a lot of what's considered uh, the rudiments of drumming, the, the 26 drum rudiments, those directly come from the uh, snare drum players um, who were out there with the soldiers. Uh, so that's very functional. And it's, it's interesting that that created a basis for uh, the kind of grooves and rhythms that we hear in 
Western popular music. Yeah, I had pomp and circumstance, which is something that's heard at college graduations. I by Edward Elgar. I um, I was in. I think I may have may have mentioned this in another show, uh, but I you know I played the trumpet in the in starting in elementary school and all the way through high school. I played a number of brass instruments. Uh, as well, but uh, one of our, our our functions was to uh, play Pomp and Circumstance 26 or 28 times while the entire class marched in for graduation. <laughs> so it was just the processional part of it, too. You don't, there's like movements to this whole uh -huh. thing no one has ever heard, <laughs> right? Because it's only the, the, the processional that, uh, that we, that we hear uh, for, for graduation, right? Yeah. And so you would have to cycle through that a couple dozen times during. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you never want to play that song again or hear that again, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> so I had uh, protest music as well. There's, there's music with uh, a, a function. So, of course, Bob Dylan in his early incarnation as a folk singer. <laughs> Uh, wrote wrote various protest songs, including "Masters of War" and "The Times They Are a Changing." Back to his uh, inspiration, uh, uh, Woody Guthrie, and uh, you know, a number you know songs about some people uh, like John Dillinger. Uh, some people rob people with a gun, and other people rob people with a fountain pen. Or, or, of course, the famous uh, missing verse from This Land is Your Land uh, that you no one ever sings, which is uh, that uh, the, on the front of the sign it says, no trespassing, but on the back it don't say nothing. Right? <laughs> yeah. Pete Seeger could be included in that list, I suppose. Joan Baez. Um, but Woody Guthrie was the generation before, and... And I'm sure there's got to be other examples of, of people singing folk music in, in protest. The Weaver. The Weavers, yeah. Um, and that kind of makes me think that, that in a way, you know, that has a specific function in terms of uh, dissent, expressing disagreement with, with uh, politics or social politics. Um, but any music with lyrics, you know, is then expressing some kind of message or, or a lot of music with lyrics, maybe not always, um, you know, something's being communicated. So there's, there's, that's functional in itself to, to share ideas, to share feelings. Um, but yeah, protest music, I think is a, is a, a good, um, addition to the list it's it's there's a specific um there's a specific space that it's designed to to inhabit and and you know at that time during the vietnam war those artists they, they were trying to affect change a change in people's consciousness i also think look like for you know look for the union label and solidarity forever you know uh, as maybe not a protest song, but uh, in some ways it is, but also team building sorts of songs, uh, you know, that the unions used, uh, you know, at rallies and, and uh, to, to bring unions in and keep them from being taken apart kind of hasn't worked that way uh, in our modern era, but, uh, but that's what they were originally, those songs were really designed to do to build teams and, and, uh, cohesion uh, in, in a union situation. And of course, that's an adv adversarial us versus them sort of situation. Yeah. Indeed. And, and I guess uh, sometimes today when you think of folk music, it's, it's kind of inextricable from, from that intention or meaning. Um, not always. A lot of folk music is just telling stories of where people come from and what their lives are like and stuff. But but um, protest music and folk music definitely 
goes hand in hand. <clears throat> Music of the people. Yeah. yeah. So uh, another area that we both had an intersection was was uh, music for dancing. So uh, yeah, uh, 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 things like uh, the power, which is uh, uh, you know everybody dance now, you know. Uh, right. And also, uh, I put in uh, uh, David Burns' uh, uh, soundtrack for the Catherine Wheel. Uh, okay. Which is, uh, and the example I have is Big Business, which, uh, you know, is choreographed by Twyla Tharp. Uh, so, yeah. And that was uh, a, a modern dance theatrical production. Right. I'm sure you may have been hipper to that at the time, being older. Uh, I was around 10 when Stop Making Sense came out by the Talking Heads, of course. And, if you could imagine me trying to find the song Big Business on the Talking Heads records, where is that song? <laughs> Eventually I figured it out, of course. But yeah, and of course they adapted it, you know, to, to fit into that concert. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see my examples. I, I felt like my examples of dance music... Um, Oh, I had going to make you sweat by CNC Music Factory, which is similar to the Snap song that you mentioned, The Power. Um, so that's kind of music to make you dance. But I was also thinking of music people use when they're working out and exercising. And the CNC Music Factory definitely seemed to, to be one of those workout songs, which kind of became popular in the 90s, I think. There was lots of workout mixes. Sweat to the oldies. That, yeah, sweat to the oldies. Well, Richard Simmons started that, I think. Yeah. There's a great, There's a great record by James Brown, which was from that period, and it's just like uh, medleys of of all of a lot of great uh, James Brown stuff, just end to end, in like these ten to twelve minute long uh, medleys, remixed and you know pump uh, with a pump in. Uh, kick drum, you know, yeah. uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, it's it works really well, um, but it you know it that definitely had a function, and and it you know it is to make people uh, get on their leotards and uh, and <laughs> red bands, you know, and their wristbands and get yeah, up. the jazzercise movement. <laughs> yeah, well. I'm sure, you know, I don't know if you go to the gym or go for jogs. I don't tend to do that stuff. But we know people today that talk about their favorite music for those situations. You know, when I go out for a run, I have to have this kind of music. Some people, it might be heavy metal. Some people, it might be that kind of housey dance music. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. I've never really done that myself but i i get it you know it's i guess it's motivational they they, they pick up the bass line you know i uh, get people moving um yeah so and they've got the you know they've got that uh, 120 uh right. you know 120 to 140 going you know and uh get people's heart rates up you got to know your bpms when you're exercising <laughs> Well, so I noticed I we have an intersection on a couple of other uh, things here, and uh, one, and uh, they're both lullabies. So I had uh, Brahms' uh, lullaby, and uh, you had Twinkle Twinkle. Yeah, yeah, and, and so Twinkle Twinkle and 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 the Brahms lullaby. Um, I I guess I I think I went from the sort of educational music for children. Then I started thinking about songs that comfort children, songs that our parents would sing to us. Uh, I didn't put a lot of examples there, but, you know, Twinkle Twinkle for some, some people might be some of the earliest music they heard, you know, um, especially of a certain era, I would think. Um, yeah, uh, one for me was Puff the Magic Dragon. Uh, 
to have that sung to me when I was a little kid. It was just so comforting. It felt like your your mother or father were, you know, wrapping you up in their arms and, and trying to sing you to sleep, you know. I don't want to sound like I'm 90, you know, but do people sing lullabies to their kids anymore, or do, is there an app for that? <laughs> Hopefully there's some good people out there that, that still make that connection. I don't think it has to be that way, but uh, yeah, it's it's a sweet, it, it, it cr it's part of that bond between you and your parent, you know? So what else? We also have we have also also Sprock Zaragustra. Yes, uh, that. And that kind of fits into one of the other things I had on there was a couple of pieces of film music that get used an awful lot. Uh, I think uh, since uh, you know the uh, 2001 movie, uh, also Sprock uh, thus spoke God. Uh, is kind of associated with that, and and then it it it, it gets tagged on either comically or semi seriously to any sort of re reveal of some of something or another. Uh, and uh, but there are a lot of pieces of classical music that get reused uh, over and over again in film. Uh, and the one uh, that I think of a lot is uh, Carmen Burana. Uh, something that you that has been in, you know, anything from flash dance to you know you you name it. It's you know it's in so many or Adagio from Strings by Samuel Barber, uh, very uh, uh, evocative um, uh, and I could you know it can almost bring you to tears uh, kind of song, but it gets used and used over and over again. And so then that brings us to things like film music, you know. Uh, yeah. The Star Wars theme, you know, John Williams, uh, of course, um, and uh, Leroy Newman, you know, these these uh, really famous film composers who uh, the music is, is specifically constructed to function in in the context of a film. It may yeah. be outside of the context of the film, but its original purpose is really to support visual material. Indeed. Um that could be an episode in and of itself, the world of film music, film scoring. And then, of course, you actually get to uh, something that's a bit more modern. I, I think it goes back. Um, it, well, it actually goes really far back, especially when you start talking about musicals. Um, but the idea of popular songs in films um, it's become more popular over the decades uh in recent history, using songs that already exist as sort of vehicle pieces to to create excitement and 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 um, highlight a, a um, an aspect of a particular scene in a movie or something, but easier, easier than easier. writing a song for a musical. <laughs> it's already written. It's already yeah. written. You just take it off the shelf. You pay the rights for it. You know. Yeah. Uh, but today it's it's. Today it's used as kind of its own art form, though. Finding those right songs that really set off a uh, a mood or evoke an emotion to go along with the scene. But in the realm of film scoring, I mean, uh, I said that could be a topic unto itself because it's it's massive. It's 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 actually a form of music that it is kind of ignored by the majority. I think um, 
I'm sure maybe people subconsciously appreciate it while they're watching a film. Um, but you know, people like you and I probably more than most collect film scores because we're, it's, it's, it, it can be very exciting. Um, and actually when you listen to them outside of the film, you hear things that you may not have even heard in the film, or maybe it gets chopped up and bits of it are used in a film. Um, and then I was going to say, I, I think there's, there's that, which is, um, you know, creating this backdrop, this, this ambient backdrop for a scene in a movie. But what you were talking about first, I think is kind of a substrain of film scoring, which are those songs like also Sprague Zarathustra, um, um, that become iconic anthemic pieces of music that you associate with a, a specific time in your life or a, a character of a movie that becomes iconic. Um, so that was a piece of music that was that already existed. It wasn't written for 2001, which it became totally associated with. But um, I was thinking stuff like uh, the theme to Rocky, Gonna Fly Now and Rocky, the, the, the two-note salvo for Jaws, which just became so iconic. Um, and so those are part of a film score, but they also take on a life of their own. It's this iconic piece of music that, that people then kind of associate with anytime this happens or if you're experiencing this in your life. You know, who hasn't sung the theme to Rocky in their head when they did something they felt was kind of triumphant, you know? <laughs> you accomplish something, you know. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. very, very functional. <clears throat> and and uh, we were talking about this the other day uh, at, at your store uh, about uh, chamber music, and uh, you know we think of classical music as sort of highfalutin and uh, intellectual uh, uh, today, but at the time it was composed for. Um, you know, royalty and, uh, you know, hangers on to sit around and play cards, you know, <laughs> and gossip and, and do whatever, you know, they did back in the, you know, the 17th and 18th century. Uh, we, you know, I, I, it's fabulous stuff. I think of like Mozart's three divertimentos is like one of my favorites. I think I had Haydn uh, on the list and Haydn wrote, of course, he lived very long <laughs> He wrote a lot, a lot of chamber music. I think it's like in the hundreds of, of different pieces. Uh, but those were all just very functional, just throwaway pieces. Fortunately, they weren't used to rat fish or anything. They were, they, uh, they did keep, somebody kept a copy of them somewhere. <laughs> but, but they were meant for, uh, for an occasion. Uh, you know, they would have these, what they call masks, which were, and, which were like plays, you know, uh -huh. where the royalties would royal royalty would play a part and they would have like, you know, big boats that they would float, you know, and do crazy stuff with, you know. And then that was the end of that piece of music. No one uh, got stuck in a drawer. And then, uh, you know, a couple hundred years later, it's now, uh, you know, um, intellectual, um, highfalutin, uh, high class music. And that's yeah. the absolute opposite of what it was at the time that is amazing that's 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 really amazing um it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that because in you know at least from a perspective of living in the 20th century there had been time for people to rediscover that stuff and examine it and and recreate it um because of course there were no recordings of classical music up until uh, a modern classical age. Um, and so then it becomes revered and exalted as, as this really high level, high brow um, uh, musical composition. I was thinking as you were talking about that, an, an analogy might be kind of, um, not a perfect analogy maybe, but when you think of like Leonardo da Vinci, um, being paid by someone to to make works of art where you know he was he was revered for his talent but but he was still working under an elite person and a lot of great artists 
uh, of, you know, centuries past, um, kind of similarly, they had to be, they had to, you know, somebody had to say, I want you to paint for me. I'd like, I'd like to have some nice pieces to hang on the wall or, or this church needs some works of art. Um, they, they didn't live a life of, of, um, of, uh, high society because they were that talented necessarily. Well, it's well, known it's that, known. that uh, there is an organization now called Patreon, which is used to support things like YouTube. Um, we have here at uh, our, our radio station, KCCH, we have a Patreon uh, page. And uh, you don't have aristocrats anymore who can fund your career in oil painting or making YouTube videos or whatever it is that you, you do, uh, NFTs, um, you, you, you know, you have to either have a steady stream of income from something else or be an established artist. Um, and yeah, Leonardo was supported by various, uh, princes here and there. Uh, and as was Bach, you know, Bach was concert master, um, I forget which king, uh, which which king it was that he worked for, but yeah, these entire these composers' entire lives was going from one royal court to another and being supported somehow. And uh, you know, we've I don't think it's bad that we've lost that now, <laughs> but it definitely uh, something needs to come in to replace it. In the 30s, uh, they, uh, they had the uh, WPA work project where they actually paid people to compose music and to write poems and to paint pictures and um, a very leftist, uh, communistic, socialistic sort of uh, idea. But uh, it was because people didn't have any other way of living, you know? I was talking about your starving artists, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that ties into something else that's uh, a little adjacent. Uh, we already talked about uh, film score, but there was that whole era in the 50s and 60s that um, we refer to now as library music. Um, so you're talking about professional musicians who are paid to record music that they didn't themselves get to release and, and, and popularize. The stuff was just, you know, given to uh, a studio's library to use when they needed it, to use it for films, commercials, backdrops of any kind, television broadcasts, things like that. And uh, DJs discovered that music because it's some of the some of the grooviest, funkiest stuff sometimes that can be sampled into into other stuff. Um, but again, that's a form of, of making music uh, for a functionality. We also uh, you you kind of came close. I had the the Star Spangled Banner in the list you know, anthems, national anthems. Um, but I think my final thing uh, that we didn't completely touch on is musical music, music of the musicals. I know we're running out of time a little bit, but I suspect you're a fan of musicals as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's functional, right? It's, it's, a form of music that's used to advance the the arc of a story, uh, of a play. Uh, and there was an era where a lot of those musical numbers became popular music, um, songs that everybody knew and loved. Today, it's not quite like that. People consider it this kind of, you know, unique culty form of, of music so we have about five minutes to close this out and i wanted to uh before we do that this is a little off topic too but i wanted to uh have you tell uh people about your other uh, uh video venture that you're, you're doing and how they can find that yes well thank you i i'm a, a very regular streamer as they say now like we're, i guess we're called streamers <laughs> and uh, I had been on a platform called Mixcloud, which was uh, designed for DJs to live stream. Uh, but I just recently moved over to Twitch. 
there's a lot there. Some people may already be familiar with it. But anyway, it lends very well towards a connection between all the DJs and a, a community support amongst all the DJs, which is really cool. Tell, um, tell us how you can find it. Okay, so it's uh, uh, twitch.tv slash DJ underscore Nighty, N-I-T-E-Y. I'm on Twitch as DJ Nighty. It's not just a replacement for being able to play out live and go see live DJs. It, it's really becoming a whole new thing. And there's a lot of people that really like to get on their laptop or their phone and just hang out and listen to the selections of DJs and chat with all the other people that come in. And, and so it's, it's a very interesting, unique thing. And as a doing what would, would have been a radio show, it's, it's a mix between radio and performance and actually really directly connecting with the listeners. So I might as well plug myself as well. I do a show down at KMUD on the first and third Saturday of every month from 2 to 4 p.m. It's called A Little Night Music in the Afternoon with uh, Motea Noche. And uh, this is actual terrestrial radio, so uh, you don't need much more than a receiver up here in Eureka. It's 88.1, 99. 91.1 down in uh, Garberville. There's a radio station in Laytonville uh, as well. And we also get out to Shelter Cove. Uh, KMUD is a great uh, organization. So um, whatever you're listening to, you're going to find something interesting and intriguing there. That's about all the time we have for today. Uh, it's been really great talking to you, uh, Bandon, as always. And I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, you can find our Spotify playlist, as I mentioned, down below. You can use the comment section to uh, suggest topics or comment uh, on us. And if we've made any mistakes, I'm sure you can spend the time uh, correcting the, the mistakes that we made. Uh, you can also contact us directly at lowpassfilter2020 at gmail.com and send in your suggestions or ideas for future shows. And we'll see you next time on Low Pass Filter. Thanks for watching Low Pass Filter. at lowpassfilter2020 at gmail.com Be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified about future shows.